Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Before we open up God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together and ask God's direction on our study. Our Father, we come in this last part of, uh, our second part of Ephesians, where we're focusing on the walk, the spiritual life of the believer, how we are to live our lives in contrast to those around us who are walking according to the principles of the world in contrast to the way we lived before we came to understand the truth of the good news that Jesus Christ had died on the cross for us, paying the penalty for our sins. And now we come to this very practical section t talking about how we should live, things we ought not do, things we should do, and what our focus should be. So, Father, as we study this, we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would make clear to us the areas wherein we need to uh, focus our attentions, where we need to grow and mature spiritually, and that we may make these areas a matter of prayer in our own lives, focusing on that which God, the Holy Spirit, is directing us to. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to... Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 32 down. We'll look at the last verse again briefly in review, and then we'll go down through 5.1 and 5.2. Uh, 5, the focus that we have seen in the previous verse is on uh, forgiving one another. That, as Paul writes it in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, we are to set aside mental attitude sins and certain overt sins which prevent us from growing spiritually. Now, that doesn't mean that we become sinless. We just can't remove it like a garment, though that's the metaphor. We can't just remove it and then we don't do it anymore because we still have a sin nature. And understanding our sin nature is really important for us in our spiritual growth, that we all have trends of our sin natures. And so some people have tendencies that are very comfortable, and they involve uh, dwelling on other people's failures, and that's being judgmental. Uh, they have other areas of weakness where they react to any, uh, any perceived slight or any perceived um, uh, action against them, and they react in... Uh, uh, bitterness or anger or resentment, all of these different mental attitude sins. And they can go into, from mental attitude sins, they can go into uh, sins of the tongue, such as evil speaking, uh, which would include a variety of sins, such as slander, uh, maligning people, gossip, uh, things of that nature, which, is, which predominates in many people's uh, Facebook pages and their social media pages. And so rather than dwelling on those things as believers, we're to set that aside. We are to uh, recognize that that is uh, a life that we're no longer alive to. We have been made new creatures in Christ. And now that we are in Christ, that we are part of that new man, the church, and there's a new standard, a new, uh, a new protocol for how we are to live. And that's the positive side stated in verse 32. We are to be kind to one another. Uh, and that doesn't mean be kind to one another when they're kind to you. Uh, be kind to one another when uh, they're being favorable to you or being kind to one another when uh, they deserve it. It is being kind to one another as 
we see here is God in Christ forgave us. We are to uh, be kind to them uh, without respect to their behavior. We are to uh, be kind to them because that is what God is. He is kind and gracious to all believers. That doesn't mean he is permissive. Uh, often Christians take the idea that grace means that God is permissive, and that's that's a problem not just in in some of our circles, but it's a problem in a lot of uh, a lot of liberal theology because they're not comfortable comfortable with a God God who is punitive, a God who will uh, who expects. Uh, uh, obedience and when there's disobedience still it could often bring divine discipline they're not comfortable with a harsh god and we'll talk about that a little more as we get into an understanding of these uh, comparisons that uh, we're forgiven even as as god uh, for christ in christ forgave you and we'll see this as we get into uh, verse 2 of chapter 5 we're to walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The whole comparison here in verse 32 and then in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 2, is going back to that work of Christ on the cross. And it's interesting how liberals play with this and how they try to explain it away because they're just not comfortable with a God who will punish sin and a God who will punish his creatures. And so it's interesting, often uh, they take positions that, that, that indicate that they really have a low view of God because they have a high view of human beings and a somewhat low view of what what sin is, even when they talk to some degree, like they understand that sin is pretty terrible, they have this low view of God as just being somewhat permissive. And that's not at all what this is talking about. It is talking about the fact that, that if anyone wrongs us, number one, God, Christ has already paid the penalty for those sins. Number two, as we have seen before in the life of David, even when we forgive them, that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences uh, in our relationship with them. There may still be consequences. In many cases, we may have been uh, betrayed in some serious way, and so that would mean that we don't continue doing business with that person. It may mean that if there is a physical or emotional abuse in a relationship, that um, we don't just act like that never happened and just continue to eat fried chicken every Sunday afternoon with those people. There may be consequences that break down that relationship because there's nothing in Scripture that m means that we have to put ourselves necessarily in a position where we're going to continue to be abused, that uh, there are those consequences. We can forgive someone, but that does not always mean that things go back to the way they may have been at one time. And that the ultimate standard is that we are to be imitators of God. So we looked at forgiveness. I, this is important to review this for some of the things that we'll see when I talk about the atonement of Christ on the cross. The words for forgive, we had two words we looked at, remember, Afi Amy emphasizes the act of forgiveness, but it also includes the idea of sort of canceling or blotting out the sin. And the other word is charizomai, which is the word that was used in, um, uh, in, in Ephesians 4, 32, forgiving one another. And this word also is used as a term for canceling out a debt. That's an important idea. Hold on to that. That's very important. So I said that there are four different categories of forgiveness. There is a forgiveness toward God where the justice of God cancels out the debt of sin. There's a clear understanding, and I'll review Colossians 3, uh, 12 to 14 here in a minute, 
there's a clear indication that there is a debt that needs to be paid. There's a penalty that needs to be paid. And as I was reading this week through some explanations of Christ's death on the cross by liberals who reject the idea of a substitutionary payment for sin, uh, they, do, uh, they do have a problem with this whole idea. In fact, one writer who allegedly has some theological training says, where do they get this idea of canceling out a debt? And I'm thinking Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. It's right there in the Bible. But see, the Bible isn't their ultimate authority. Their ultimate authority is, is their own idolatrous concept of God as a loving God. So we have this forgiveness of sin that I call forensic forgiveness because Christ paid the penalty for all sin. He canceled the debt at the cross. It was nailed to the cross. It happened in 33 AD. It's nailed to the cross. Then there's forgiveness that we receive once we trust Christ as Savior. That's when we are baptized by God the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ. And because of that, in our new legal position, our new legal identity, we're in Christ so that, so that that new identity means that we are forgiven positionally. And no matter what we may do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of committing sins, we are still in Christ. We can never lose that position. We are assured of our salvation because we are kept by the power of God. And that is uh, given many times uh, in Scripture. Uh, third, there is experiential forgiveness. That's when we confess sin. And God forgives us of those sins and then goes on graciously to forgive us of all sins. Some people say, I just can't think of all my sins. That's right. There's not a single one of us who could probably list more than 3% of our sins since midnight, and y'all haven't been up that long. We're just, we aren't aware of how many times we sin in so many, many little ways. Just turn on the news 30 seconds, and it'll take you three hours to confess sin and get back in right relationship with the Lord. Um, some of you will take a lot longer than that. Uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes when things, especially when things are very close to us and very personal, but God forgives us because of what Christ did on the cross. That's 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. That doesn't mean it automatically happens because that's stated uh, differently in verse 9. Fourth, there's relational forgiveness, and that is now when we have to apply to one another what God, for Christ's sake, applies to us. That's where it gets hard when we have to forgive one another and not dwell on it. Reminding you of Colossians 12, 13, especially 12, 13, and 14, that we see here that the referring to the past, Paul writes, uh, previously we were dead in our transgression and the uncircumcision of our flesh. That's talking about spiritual circumcision, not physical circumcision. He said he made you alive together with him because he had already graciously canceled or forgiven all of our transgressions. There's that word charizomai. When did that happen? It happened at the end of verse 14. He nailed it to the cross. So he had already graciously canceled or forgiven our transgressions by eradicating that certificate of debt. That's the transaction that takes place on the cross and that Jesus willfully goes there because he knows there's a legal penalty that must be paid. So then we come to chapter 5, verse 1. It begins with a therefore, as I've pointed out, which indicates a conclusion. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, what's interesting here is that they put the chapter division between 32, uh, between the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. Now, I have heard people say, that's good, that's right. Why do they say that? I don't agree with them, but this is, this is really kind of gets into a little grammar and stuff, but I'm not going to um, 
spend too much time on that. I, I think it's important, and, and there's a lot of disagreement over this. And that is because if you go back to how Paul writes in Ephesians, we'll just go back to the beginning of chapter 4. He begins new sections with a therefore. Verse 1, I therefore. But what is, else does he say? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy. You have therefore, and you have a command to walk. If you turn down and go to verse 17, this I say therefore. See, he's beginning a new section. And he says what? And testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. So you have some guys who say, see, it's the therefore. So that starts a new paragraph. Others will say, ah, it's the command to walk. That's what starts the new paragraph. So that's why you have this, this distinction, because you get to chapter 5, verse 1, and you have a conclusion statement in verse 1, but not a walk command. The walk command comes in verse 2. I personally think that the issue in this chapter down through 6, 9 is how we live our lives and how we walk, and so... It's the walk command that shifts gears from one topic, one discussion to the next, indicating the paragraph break, not necessarily the therefore, because in the two previous instances, the therefore and the walk command are in the same sentence. Here, they're separated. So some people say, well, what difference does that make? Well, I'm just explaining why your Bible versifies and chapter divides one way and I take it a slightly different way. And I think that the conclusion here to be imitators of God as dear children is just echoing what was said in the previous verse. It's not a conclusion to the previous whole previous section, I think. I think it's just a conclusion to what is said in the previous uh, set of verses going back to the command in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Be the conclusion in chapter 4 really isn't at 32, but the, the previous sentence is, even as God in Christ forgave you, therefore be imitators of God. 5.1 is, is reinforcing what was said in the previous verse that we are to do what God does. We are to follow the pattern of divine forgiveness. We are to forgive others as God ha in Christ has forgiven us. We are to imitate him. And then the next command is to walk in love, and that will cover when we get to verse 2. So 5.1 begins almost the same way as verse 32. It begins with the same verb. Uh, this is the verb genomai, which it means to become or to become something that you weren't already. So verse 32, began and become kind to one another. Not to be, but to become. It's emphasizing our spiritual growth. And the same here, it says, therefore become imitators of God as dear children. So again, it's emphasizing this spiritual growth. So I see that as being closely connected, both verse 32 and verse 1 of chapter 5 uh, start the same way. I think that's where the connection is. So we are to become imitators of God. Now to imitate God... What must you do? We have to understand who God is and what God has done and how he has done it and why he has done it to imitate him. We, we can't just make up in our minds the kinds of things that God would do. Uh, usually people think of what God would do if I were God. Uh, we have to understand the scriptures and the more we study the more we read the scriptures the more we come to understand who God is and what he has done in history and of course the greatest thing that he's done in history is to provide for our salvation and that's what becomes uh, the pattern it's the pattern of verse 32 and it's the pattern when we get into uh, 5 2 
but we're to be imitators of God. This is the Greek word mimetes. We get our word mimic from this word. We are to mimic God. We are to, uh, we're to be a finite copy of God. Where do we see that idea? Where does that take us? That takes us back to uh, Genesis chapter 1, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are a finite representative of God. And once you're saved and we are regenerated, we're born again, we become a new creature in Christ, we're back on that process of spiritual growth where God is forming in us the character of Jesus Christ. Galatians 5 uh, 5.16 says that we are to walk by means of the Spirit. And when we do that, he produces fruit in us. And that fruit is a description of, it's, notice it's one fruit. He doesn't produce many fruits. One is love, one is joy, one is peace, one is patience, one is kindness. It's one fruit that has all of these facets to it. It's the character of Jesus Christ. So we are to become uh, imitators of God. And we see this in other passages where Paul talks about this. In 1 Corinthians, twice he uses this word for imitate. In verse uh, 16 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. Now if that's all we had, some people might say, well, that seems kind of arrogant on the part of the Apostle Paul to imitate him. But he clarifies it when you get to 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. He's, he's basically, the subtext there is don't imitate me when I, my sin nature gets a hold of me and I am not obeying God. Imitate me in the ways I am imitating Christ. So he's not saying just blanket, just be like me, but no, 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 be like me when I'm following the Lord. Be like me as I'm applying doctrine. Imitate me in those ways. It's interesting that in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he uses the word imitate, but in these passages, he's talking about the suffering uh, that the Thessalonica believers are going through the opposition that they felt. Remember, he wasn't there very long. He'd been in Philippi. He left Philippi. He went down to Thessaloniki, and he went first to the synagogue, spoke there a couple of times, and then the Jews really reacted to him. And he was only there for a couple of months before he basically needs to leave town because of the uh, rising threats against his life. So he's not there very long. And the believers that were uh, Jewish background believers that were, lived there are still going through suffering. And he says, and you became followers. Now that's the word mimetes. You became imitators or mimics of us and of the Lord. Notice he adds this. He knows that our role model is Jesus Christ. Our role model is not the Apostle Paul or John or any other human being, but it may be a role model of a human being because they have grown to maturity and they're exhibiting Christ's likeness in some ways that we should pay attention to. And I don't know about you, but I've had the privilege of knowing and working with and under some men who were extremely focused upon the Lord in their lives. I, I knew they had weaknesses and they had failures, but these were men who, who j you knew they had a very close walk with the Lord. And there are times in my life, especially more so when I was younger, I'm getting situations and I think, well, I wonder how so-and-so would handle this. You know, and I would think about them. And so we, we see that, and we have, uh, they, they are a role model because of the way they're imitating Christ. They, they give us a more tangible example uh, in front of us. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, be, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And then we have one of those participial phrases there, having received the word. And there, it, I think it may have a causal sense because you received the word in much affliction. 
Or it could be temporal when you receive the word in much affliction. But what he's pointing out is that they valued the word. They made it a priority. And even though they were, uh, they were being ridiculed by some of their family members, uh, that they were facing hostility from people in their, uh, in their Jewish community there in Thessaloniki, that they, they still valued the word in spite of the suffering that it brought, the opposition and the rejection that it brought. They received the word. They made it a priority. And see, there's far too many believers who, in the face of adversity or peer pressure, they, they're kind of embarrassed about the fact that they're, they're really a Christian. And part of their problem, and I know that, it, and this is true in many cases, because of their immaturity in their faith, they really don't know how to answer any of the questions or objections that they hear. So they, 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 you know, they fall into a trap. What they need is to be with Christians more and be studying the word more and growing more so that they can handle that kind of opposition and adversity. And it's amazing the level of respect that is gained as you, as you do that. I remember when I was getting serious about my walk with the Lord when I was about a, between my, my sophomore and junior year, and I'd have guys make snide remarks and everything, but I stood my ground. I continued to grow. I didn't know how to answer whatever comments there were. You know, I always loved the ones. I'm the guy who got a flat top right before my senior proms, you know, back in the Vietnam era, so I've never been one to be swayed a whole lot by by the social pressures, uh, but but I re I remember that I would um, would get this, and some somebody would say, "Ah, you're just a Jesus freak." Really? Let's see. I can barely get a hold of my hair. I went to school on an ROTC scholarship. Back then, we had a nice short haircut. So you just have to learn to grow in those situations and that's what they were facing this kind of opposition they received the word in much affliction with joy of the holy spirit it's not a joy that you manufacture on your own when people don't like you or they're making snide remarks or sarcastic remarks or they won't invite you to things that you'd wish you could go to but now that you're making your christian testimony uh, clear they don't they they say things that um, that they may live to regret, but it's the Holy Spirit who produces the joy in you. It's like love. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You can't manufacture it on your own. As you walk by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit develops that in you. And first, that's 2.14, so just in the second chapter, he says, for you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of Christ, not just of Paul and his... Uh, his associates, but of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. What did they have in common with those who were in Judea? Opposition from the Jews that were around them and rejected the idea that Jesus was the promised and prophesied Messiah. He goes on to say, For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. And so what enabled them to, uh, to go forward was that they were learning to imitate Christ by seeing how Paul and those with him handled the similar situations. And then in Hebrews 6, 12, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. He's, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that you do not, do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish uh, background believers. Uh, they were probably, many of them were former Levitical priests who had become believers, and they're facing opposition. So these three passages all have that kind of background, learning how to imitate Christ in difficult situations. In Galatians 4.19, Paul writes to the Galatians, he says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. 
That's the goal, is the character of Christ formed in us. That's what he's talking about. And that character is just another way of talking about the fruit of the Spirit, the gr growing. Romans 8, 29. The, everybody should know the previous verse that we know that all things work together for good to those who uh, love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then there's an explanation in verse 29, for whom he foreknew. And then it says he also... Uh, predestined. And that is a bad translation. The word there is praharizo. I did a lengthy study of that back in Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. It's only used five times in Scripture and only one time really, haridzo, one time in extra biblical Greek, has the idea when you trace it out of being appointed to a task. And when Paul talks about this in Ephesians, he's talking about we, the church, are appointed to a task. And so this is also the idea here. He's talking about the body of Christ for whom he foreknew, for those he knew ahead of time. The word uh, uh, foreknowledge means to know something ahead of time. That's how, it means that everywhere it's used. So for those he knew ahead of time, he also appointed to be conformed to the image of his son. What he's saying there is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God's goal for you is to be conformed to Jesus Christ. And God the Holy Spirit, who dwells each and every one of us, that he is, his mission is to work in our lives to take us to that place where we conform to the image of Christ, to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Now, if you are a rebellious believer and you say, oh, I once believed that, but now I don't believe that anymore, and I'm just going to live the way I want to live like all of my friends do, they seem to be a lot happier and they have a much better life and they don't have to go to church and learn the Bible all the time and... Uh, some people will call that being out of fellowship, which isn't a bad term. It means that we are not walking with the Lord. Now, some people get the idea, well, that means that the Holy Spirit isn't working in your life because you're not walking by the Spirit. It doesn't mean that at all. It means God, the Holy Spirit, is not going to be producing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, but he's going to be working to get you back to that point where you will confess sin and get back in right relationship with him and walk with him. So he's going to be convicting you and reproving you and correcting you. And that's part of his ministry is to uh, make life tough for you in terms of the adversity and conflicts in your soul until you finally say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to quit fighting, and i got to get back with the Lord. Now, some people may never get back there again, and then you're going to go through some, some really tough divine discipline. But all he is saying here is the goal, after you are saved, you're just a baby. And God wants you to be mature so that you can have an effective spiritual life and ministry serving the Lord. So if you rebel against him, he's still going to work in your life, but to correct you and bring you back to a point where you will uh, correct, your, correct your course, uh, confess sin, uh, and get back with God's plan so you're working on the same thing that the Holy Spirit is working on. But when you're rebellious, it's just going to eventually make you miserable. For a while, you may deceive yourself into thinking that everything's going well, but then sooner or later, it isn't. So for whom he foreknew, he knew ahead of time that there were those who were going to believe in Christ, and he ordained the body of Christ to establish the church. We study that in Ephesians 1 and appointed those who would be in the body of Christ, appointed those who are believers to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the focal point, character transformation. And Romans 12, 2 looks at the other side. Don't be conformed. The idea there is don't be pressed into the mold of the world. 
but be transformed. How are you transformed? By renewing your thinking, renovating your thinking. You, you have to be overhauled. You, you ha let's say you have a project where you have a house and you just know there needs to be some, some work done on the house, that there are some problems, you need a new roof, there are some areas maybe you've got some mold in the walls and so you need to get that straightened out. But for the most part, you're pretty happy with the house, but you need to have a contractor come in, uh, maybe um, uh, put some new appliances into your kitchen, get, get it overhauled. And God the Holy Spirit is the, is the project manager. And when he shows up, he doesn't show up with just a bunch of paint and hammers and a few things necessary to tear out a wall here or a wall there. He shows up in a bulldozer and he takes it down to the foundation, destroys the foundation and says, now we're going to start. You have to renovate everything. You can't just hold on to some of your some ideas that make you comfortable. So we're not to be pressed into the mold of the world, but there's supposed to be a total renovation, a total overhaul of our thinking. Not just the content of our thinking. Well, I'm not going to think about these kinds of things. I'm not going to think about lustful things. That that's content. He's talking about the framework of your thinking, that you're going to think within a biblical worldview. You have to learn what that means. You're going to think in terms of everything that God says, not just the content of what you think about, but how you think, the structure of your thinking. If you were born in America and you were reared outside of a church, you grew up being, being brainwashed into thinking like a postmodern relativist. You may not even know what those terms mean, but that's what you do. You're an existentialist. Everything's about me. And you've got to figure out how to not think in that format anymore. So you sort of have to reformat your spiritual hard drive. That begins with trusting Christ as your Savior and being uh, born again, the Scripture says, made a new creature in Christ. But you're a babe. So as 1 Peter 2.2 says, we are to desire the unadulterated milk of the word, that we may grow by it. That's the only way you're going to grow as a believer, is to internalize the word of God. And that means you, we've got to submit ourselves to the teaching of God's word somewhere where we're going to truly, truly learn the word. And then as we grow and mature, our life becomes evidence uh, of God's grace. We demonstrate in our life that God's will is good and acceptable and complete because we're living according to his word. So the command is, therefore, become imitators of God. And then he says, as dear children. This is an interesting word translated dear. It should be translated beloved. Beloved children. It's the Greek word agapetas, and it is frequently used of an only child, a one and only child, of a parent who pours all of their love into that one child that they have. I speak as an only child. That many times I thought, I wish I had a brother and sister. My mother wouldn't dote on me so much. No, but that's, that's what happens when you're, you're an only child. And there were other dimensions to that one because I think my mother probably would have, but because she had had polio right before I was born, she was unable to have children again. And she, she, so everything just gets focused on me. God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. That means each one of you who is a child of God is treated like you're the only one. You're loved like you're the only one. And you get the full bore love of God, each one of us, because he can do that. He doesn't have to spread it out over all the different believers. So we are dear, beloved uh, children, and he loves us. So we are to be imitators of God because we are beloved by God. Then we start, I believe, the next walk command, 
We have had other walk commands. We are to um, walk worthy of the calling by which we've been called. We're not to walk like the Gentiles, but now we are to walk in love. The word walk is a command. Peripateo means to emphasize his step-by-step walking. And we live our life moment by moment, day by day, step by step. It's a great analogy to how we conduct our lives. And so we are to walk by means of love. And we have to understand what that is. We live in a world where love is defined as emotion. But love with God is not an emotion It is a mental attitude of desiring the absolute best for the object of love. Now, we have to really talk about that because uh, a lot of us, if we're self-centered, we love somebody because of what they can do for us. I often joke that sometimes I'd like to stand up in front of a couple that's getting married and uh, give the real vows, what they're really thinking, that, that I pledge my love to you as long as you continue to make me feel as wonderful as you've made me feel the last year or two that you're going to do all of these wonderful things for me, and I am just going to uh, bask in all of your adoration for me. And uh, that's what a lot of people think when they get married, that this person's going to do all these things for me, and life's going to be wonderful. But um, that, that's not what biblical love is. Biblical love is desiring the best according to the standards of God. So you have to understand the standards of God. Because when two people come together to get married, they're not getting to, together to get married for what they can do for each other, but what they can do together as a team in serving the Lord. That we come together in marriage, going back to the pattern of Adam and Eve and their creation, that God gave them responsibilities in the garden. It was more than, than Adam could do on his own. He needed a helper. So God said, it's not good for man to, to be alone. I will make a helper or an assistant for him so that together they can work together to glorify God. That is the purpose in marriage. And so to understand biblical love that should be part of a marriage, we have to understand the love of God. Later on, when we get down into the relationship between husbands and wives later in, uh, uh, in this fifth chapter, uh, the husband is to love his wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That is the role of the husband. He is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. So the backdrop to a lot of things in chapter 5 is going to be an accurate understanding of how Christ loves the church and how that relates to these different areas of our life. So we are to walk in love or by means of love as, that's a point of comparison. So the standard, the model is Christ as Christ has loved us. So I've got the, you have the noun agape and then the verb agapao here and that his loving us is exemplified. I think we could even translate that next and more as what the grammarians would call an ascensive chi. Even it emphasizes the next and and it enhances it. Even giving himself for us that that's how he loved us. This is what John 3.16 says in a slightly different way. For God, often it's translated, God loved the world so much. God, that's not what it says. The, the Greek word there is hutos, and it means God loved in this way. And if I were translating, I would say God loved in this way, colon. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Christ loved us, gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So it's very clear that this passage teaches us that Christ gave himself as an offering and as a sacrifice. That, that becomes that becomes the pattern. And so 
It's important to understand this word that's translated gave himself for us. It is the preposition huper in the Greek. And the word for us is in the genitive case. Now, that's important grammatically because that is one of two ways that the Greek language uh, would express substitution. Substitution. And this is an aspect or a doctrine <coughs> that has often been misunderstood in Christianity, that Christ died as a substitute for us. He was a sacrifice in our place. And you have other passages in Scripture, many passages, actually we'll see several of them, who use this word to indicate that substitutionary facet of Christ's sacrifice for us. In John 6, 51, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. So he's using a metaphor. Uh, Jesus isn't saying he's a loaf of bread any more than when he said, I, I am the good shepherd, that he's talking about that he's a literal shepherd, or I am the gate, I am the door. Uh, these are metaphors to explain certain things. He's the living bread. He's a source of our nourishment, spiritual nourishment and provision. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, eating and drinking are often pictures of faith, to accept something, to take it into our lives, to receive it. John uh, John 1, 12, but as many as received him. It's the idea of you're receiving him as you uh, metaphorically eating the bread is a picture of faith. You're trusting in him as your source of nourishment. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh. He's giving his flesh for us. He's going to die on the cross for us, which I shall give for the life of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 uh, also using this bread metaphor, uh, Paul is writing, he says, purge out the old leaven. Leaven was a picture of sin. So he's talking about cleansing from sin, 1 John 1, 9. Uh, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly are unleavened. That's position in Christ. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now we're going to have to come back and unpack this from the, the Old Testament a little bit more next time, but I'm just emphasizing this. He was sacrificed for us. Now that's important because as I was reading those who want to uh, rebel against the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, substitutionary sacrifice, they said that just is, makes God a horrible God. I have a good friend now uh, well, we've always been friends, but we were in junior high band, summer before seventh grade. I played trombone, he played a baritone, and we were together all through high school. And then we, um, we sort of reconnected over the years. He, he married a gal whose mother was the organist at Baraka. And then um, uh, his secretary, legal secretary, now sings in our choir. So we've had this, you know, back and forth. We've always had our lives intertwined. And, and I said one day, I said, well, Jay, when did you get saved? He said, well, I wasn't saved in high school back then. I didn't get saved till I went off to Baylor. But he didn't get saved at, at Baylor. He got saved because he went to a church in Waco that gave the gospel. And he understood it, and he began to grow, and he's very studious, and he's one of the sharpest, uh, let's, I'll put it this way, untrained. He's never been to Bible college or seminary, but he is a student of the Word and theology and reads widely, and I can talk with him about just about anything. And, and he said, when I came back from, from, uh, from, from college, moved back to Houston, I, I went to a Methodist church over in Bel Air, and I was, um, I was in there, and I was in a Sunday school class. And uh, then he taught the Sunday school class. I believe that's the way it went. And he was te teaching on substitutionary atonement. And he had one lady in the church who was, there's always your formal power structure, especially in a church that's been around a lot of, a lot of decades. And then your informal structure. And those are the people, they don't serve on a board, but they have power in the church for one reason. And she said... I don't believe that. I don't believe God is so cruel that he's going to punish his son on our behalf. That, that's a primitive doctrine. That's just horrible. 
That, that just makes God into, into just some cruel person. We can't have a God like that. That was the first time he'd ever run across that. And that's, that's typical. That is the basic line. God, God's not a loving God if he's going to have his son die in my place. We, I can't accept that. Well, you're starting with a concept of love that you pick up from the culture, not starting from Scripture. Scripture's not your authority. But see, this is so common today that there are people who just have their own ideas, and we need to understand what what Scripture teaches. And it's very clear that Christ was sacrificed for us. Hebrews 9, 7 says into uh, the second part, the high priest went alone. That is going into the Holy of Holies. Scott Stripling talked about that, I think, the other night. About, And I remember standing there to stand there in Shiloh and look at where the Holy of Holies was. You can see the walls. This was where the Ark of the Covenant was for over 300 years. God dwelt right there. I mean, that was one of the most moving things I, I've ever realized or experienced in in Israel. So the high priest once a year went alone, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people since. It's a substitutionary idea. So next time we'll come back and we'll talk more about what the Bible teaches about this vicarious penal substitution. You'll learn the vocabulary. Vicarious means it's substitutionary. Penal means it's a legal punishment. And what does atonement mean? Well, that's interesting in itself, so you'll have to come back next time. But the point of Scripture is Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for us. There was a legal penalty assigned to sin, and that's spiritual separation from God. And everybody since Adam was born spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1, we were, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And you skip down to verse 5. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, but God made us alive together with him, raised us with him, and seated us together with him. The only way that you can be made alive together with Christ is to trust in him, to recognize that that thought is then developed in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, that is, that faith is not of yourselves, that, that salvation, by grace through faith salvation is not of yourselves. God provided it through Christ, who died on the cross for your sins. And the issue isn't works, the issue is faith. You have to trust in Christ. And when we trust in Christ at that instant, you are made alive together with him. And we have eternal life. And that we will live forever. And when we leave this life, we go face to face with the Lord into a, a dimension where there'll be no more sorrow, no more tear, no more pain, for the old things have passed away. And we will be with Christ forever. Now, we aren't absorbed into some entity in heaven. We have our own identity, and we will uh, serve the Lord, serve God forever. And he hasn't really described that so much in Scripture because we couldn't comprehend it if he did. But if you want eternal life, then that comes by trusting in Christ who paid the penalty on the cross for us that we might have everlasting life. And that's the foundation for love. That's the uh, foundation for walking in love. That's the foundation for being able to forgive one another understanding what Christ did on the cross with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study, study these things today, to be reminded of your uh, infinite love for us and the fact that you had a perfect plan for salvation, a plan where the legal penalty of sin would be paid for by Christ on the cross, not by his physical suffering, not by his physical death, but by that that period of three hours where he was separated from you judicially so that he who knew no sin was made sin on behalf of us, for us, that your righteousness would be found in us. Father, we pray that we may uh, recognize that, develop that in our own lives, that we might be challenged to continue to grow and mature as believers.
that we may serve you and glorify you with our lives. Father, we pray that those who are here or who are listening would recognize that there is salvation in no other name under heaven other than Jesus Christ. And he is the focus of our faith, to trust in him and his death on our behalf on the cross. And Father, we pray God the Holy Spirit would make that abundantly clear to them. And Father, we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand together for our closing hymn. It is number 76, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Number 76, and I'm going to ask uh, Greg Freehoff if he would please come up to dismiss us in closing prayer. Ms. Bowles, we close in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for our local church, for our pastor. We thank you so much for the absolute truth of the written word that lives and abides forever. And we just uh, pray that you would help us to be motivated to continue to grow in grace so that we can eventually become imitators of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and be able to forgive those who have wronged us through the help of the Holy Spirit. And we uh, ask all these things, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.